On this episode of In the Fight, U.S. and NATO forces in Europe gear up for Operation Atlantic Resolve. Seventy years later, we sit down with a veteran of the Battle of Iwo Jima. Army and Air Force personnel team up to deliver heavy artillery. Navy and Marine Corps forces bring vehicles from ship to shore. And wounded warriors take a risk to compete in new sports. U.S. soldiers are gearing up for Operation Atlantic Resolve, a multinational training mission taking place across several NATO countries in Eastern Europe. SHAPE correspondent Edward Boquette talks to Army Major General John O'Connor to find out how this mission strengthens relationships in the area. The Liberty Promise represents uh, America's response to building readiness and responsiveness as part of Operation Atlantic Resolve. Atlantic Resolve is a series of exercises which brings together capabilities of the United States military as well as the uh, Baltic State military and the Black Sea military. So from Estonia all the way down to Bulgaria, the arrival of the Liberty Promise today with U.S. capability from the 3rd Infantry Division it demonstrates that uh, we can bring not only airborne and striker formations and armor capability, but the mechanized capability today from this division, and it will be incorporated into a series of multinational exercises uh, to demonstrate our resolve for security and global cooperation uh, with our NATO alliance and partners. With the present threat of Russian incursion in Eastern Europe, Operation Atlantic Resolve is a timely reminder of NATO's power in the region. It's also a valuable tool for different member nations to support and learn from each other. As Army Staff Sergeant Pablo Piedra reports, U.S. snipers partnering with Latvian soldiers are doing just that. Our mission here today is to work alongside our Latvian allies. Uh, they are conducting a town uh, clearing mission with their infantry platoon, and we are going to act as their sniper team overwatching their position, uh, overwatching their uh, clearing mission through the village, and also engaging any targets of opportunity that we uh, see from our position. Our main objective is, one, not be seen by any enemy that are in the area. Then it is to have a good field of fire and observation views to uh, be able to see as much of the battlefield as we can. The thing I like the most about training in Latvia is being able to work with the Latvian soldiers and seeing how their army works compared to our army. And we can take some of their SOPs and the way that they do things and we can incorporate it into our operations in it. I think it just makes us that much better. Seventy years ago, U.S. forces stormed the beaches at Iwo Jima, eventually capturing the island from Japan but not before 36 days of hard-fought battles. Marine veteran Wally Kanzig experienced 26 of those days, surviving the battle that took the life of 6,800 Americans. Navy Petty Officer Second Class Dominique Pinheiro brings us this veteran's story. I had a fellow here, he wanted to see if they couldn't write a book about the heroes in Atlantic County. I said, let me tell you something. Those of who are here who came home are not the heroes. The heroes are those who never came home. Well, they never wrote the book. War is dirty, it's brutal, it's dehumanizing, and that was Iwo Jima. We were watching the landing from the uh, flagship for the, the Atlantic Force. The worst part of it became apparent immediately. Oh, 
they allowed the first several waves, I think it was, uh, well, it was at least two and probably three waves to get on the beach. So they had this concentration of Marines on the beach and then they opened up and they just knocked the devil out of us. Every round hid something or somebody. It was bad. I landed on beaches in the Kwajalein and Saipan and Tinian, and I never saw bodies like that stacked on the beach. You know, you'd have to be a person here, a body there, but nothing like that. You had to pick your route through them. That's how bad it was. I thought the first night and the second night might be the last days of my life. I was convinced there was no way that we were going to survive that with the amount of uh, enemy uh, ammunition that was falling upon us. Bodies were all over. So I said my goodbyes, said my prayers, uh, said goodbye to my wife, knowing that I wasn't going to survive. I was never where around landed. And to this day, it was hard for me to believe. And you say, uh, what made them continue on, knowing what was going to happen? Well, two things. One, you were a Marine, and you knew that you couldn't fail. You had to do your job. And the second thing, you were an American, and you knew you had to do your job as an American. There was no question that you were going to do the, the job that was, you were charged with. You were trained, you were told, you were expected to do what was supposed to be done. I'm PFC Neverett, on Samos, y'all. I'm stationed in Kuwait with 1-5 Field Artillery, Alpha Battery 2nd Platoon. Just want to send a shout out to my mom, dad, friends and family out in Cardinal, Georgia. Miss y'all, love y'all. I'll see y'all soon. Hello, I'm Captain Freddie Smith of 13 ESC here in Camp Air of John, Kuwait. I would like to send a special shout out to my wife, Tracy Lynn Smith. Sweetheart, I love you so deeply and I miss you. I will be home soon. Coming up. Navy and Marine Corps forces deliver vehicles shipped to shore. And Air Force EOD team members get back to basics. Check out divotshub.net for the latest accurate and reliable information as In the Fight continues. The iconic flag raising on Iwo Jima took place on which mountain? The answer when we return. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divots, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7. When you put on the uniform, you are held to a higher standard. A lot of times, you're not going to know what's going to be thrown at you. So you need to be ready for anything. Stress can affect every Marine and Marine family. It's very hard for me to have a career when we're always moving around. We have the same bills that everybody else does. And you never want to let your staff and see us down. The de-stress line provides anonymous counseling for Marines and Marine families when it's needed most. It takes courage to ask for help. Call today and let us help you win your personal battles.
The iconic flag raising on Iwo Jima took place on which mountain? The answer is A, Mount Suribachi. There's a lot that goes into delivering heavy equipment to the front lines, and communication between branches is often key. During a recent joint training exercise, Air Force Senior Airman Robert Gunn discovered the complicated process of safely delivering an artillery system hundreds of miles away. The M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System. Here it is nestled in the hills of Fort Carson, Colorado, a long way from its home in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. How did it get here? Well, that's where Altus Air Force Base comes in. We're actually integrating a joint mission uh, scenario. So we're taking a scenario that the Army generated and applying it to our exercise today. So it's taking their objectives and our objectives, combining them together. So we're flying up to Colorado Springs so they can practice the High Mars mission. Stop! And for both services, this translates into real-world mission capability. It's as real as we can make it. Uh, and, and again, just the capability that we'll be able to demonstrate today, being able to roll off immediately from an airframe, the C-17, and then immediately go into our live fires. It's, it's just an amazing opportunity today. So today we have multiple desired learning objectives, We're looking for mountainous, um, low-level flight, VFR ridge crossings, and also integrating uh, with our joint partners. But this training isn't just pilots, loadmasters, and soldiers. The airmen from the 97th Logistics Readiness Squadron need to make sure this cargo is loaded just right. The way I play into it is just uh, the go between the, the Army unit and then the aircraft that's doing the airlift. Um, they can't just roll up to an airplane and say, hey, take this. It doesn't work that way. There's certain steps and procedures that have to happen, and uh, we're the middleman for that. Um, making sure it's airworthy, nobody's going to get injured, nobody's going to get hurt, and safety of flights. A lot of work to make this happen, but just as much reward. For the 97th Air Mobility Wing, I'm Senior Airman Robert Gunn. Transporting equipment and vehicles on the water also typically involves joint communication. Marine Corporal Christopher Moore caught up with 1st Combat Engineer Battalion Marines who are training with the Navy to coordinate ship-to-shore vehicle delivery. Marines with 1st Combat Engineer Battalion conducted a ship-to-shore exercise on White Beach aboard Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, California. The purpose of the training is to help better train us so we can be better prepared for future endeavors. This job helps uh, support the Marine Corps by making sure that we're better trained and we can support the MEF in any way we can. The Marines did really good today. They're really motivated and they knew what to do as soon as they got on the LCAC. The training involved the successful cooperation between Navy and Marine Corps forces to move vehicles from offshore to land using a landing craft air cushion or LCAC. Training, 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 repetitive training. If future deployments and we get called last minute, not everybody's lost. So we know what to do, we already know how to mount the equipment, load it, strap it down. So we could just take away the headache of, all right, we've never done this, we gotta train. Instead of, hey, we've already done it before, we're good to go. The Navy provides the landing zone for the LCACs. The Marines are then directed to where they need to go. Once that is complete, the LCAC returns to the ship to load another vehicle. Reporting from Camp Pendleton, California, I'm Corporal Christopher Moore. Port security is an important task, especially in a deployed location. Air Force Staff Sergeant Jessica Walter introduces us to the riverines of Camp Lemagne, who are providing security in the waters of East Africa. On October 12, 2000, in the port of Aden in Yemen, suicide bombers on an explosive-laden boat attacked the USS Cole, killing 17 sailors and wounding 37. In an effort to prevent attacks like this one from occurring again, the Coastal Riverine Squadron 1 patrols the waters of East Africa, providing security for service members supporting Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa and Camp Lemigné in the port of Djibouti. Providing security for the ships that are here, it's vitally important. We're here to provide an overwatch for the guys that are coming here. They're coming here dropping off supplies here for the camp. They're also picking up supplies to take it out to the fleet and keep our US, U.S. Navy warships afloat and underway. We basically help ensure that no small boats or other traffic gets in their way. We also ensure that uh, 
Nobody tries to do uh, any harm to them while they're coming into port. Even when the day's mission leaves these riverines on the water for 8 to 16 hours at a time, they never lose sight of why they are needed. With what happened to the USS Cole, it, it's why we get up every day. It's to make sure that it never happens again to our ships or any of our NATO country, you know, brother, sister countries. When they pull in a port, we provide security for them to make sure that doesn't happen. Thanks to the Riverines, Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa can rest easier knowing these CRS-1 sailors are on patrol. Reporting from Djibouti, I'm Air Force Staff Sergeant Jessica Walter. After 12 years of high-risk deployment to operations Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom, explosive ordnance disposal airmen are getting back to basics. 88th Air Base Wing Public Affairs Correspondent John Harrington takes us to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for this story. The snowy landscape of southwest Ohio is a far cry from the battlefield, but the skills learned here could be just as valuable when it comes to combating improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. It may look like a normal mailbox, but inside is a device designed to kill. Fortunately, it's just a training IED, but the lessons learned are real. So IEDs are very creative when it comes to the bomb maker, and it also requires the tech to be able to think on their toes and think one step ahead of a bomb maker. It's that thinking on their toes part that Stadsvold is testing today. The work site is in what's called a permissive environment. Basically, there's nothing happening around the operators to either distract or interfere with their disposal process. It's been a long time since EOD units have been able to really focus on the finesse aspect of their skills. High deployment tempos in non-permissive environments worked in operators' ability to clear a danger quickly, but not necessarily as safely as possible. Being able to spend additional time now, focused on diagnostic techniques using x-ray and other equipment, could save lives if these technicians get called again to fight. When they apply permissive training to non-permissive environments, they can more quickly realize what's happening and get that non-permissive situation resolved a lot faster. Once thoroughly examined, the team leader decides how best to render safe the IED. From there, it's just a matter of executing the plan, albeit carefully. In this case, it's using a water shot to disrupt the firing chain of the IED. Today's exercise went really well. Team worked really well together. We were able to prosecute uh, the problem. Uh, no difficulties at all. Yeah. From Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, I'm John Harrington. Hi, how's it going? My name is uh, Specialist Brian Klingler. Uh, this is a shout out from Camp Beer in Kuwait. And I'd like to uh, give a big shout out to my beautiful wife, uh, Brittany Klingler, uh, back in Janesville, Wisconsin. I love you and I miss you and can't wait to come home to you. This is PFC Daniel Allison from the 5 Mountain CSSB out of Virginia Beach, Virginia, calling home in Mesquite, Texas to Tracy Lynn Chittenden. Thank you for standing by me for all these past months. I'll be home in a little bit, baby. I love you. Coming up, wounded warriors take on unique challenges to compete in new sports, and we'll showcase some of the best photos from our service members, as In the Fight, presented by Divids, continues. Service members are allowed to compete in the warrior games with which of these injuries? The answer when we return. From combat-related stress to the day-to-day -day stressors of life. This package is going to be completed. This is the fourth time this week. Stress can affect every Marine and Marine family. The De-Stress Line provides anonymous counseling for Marines and Marine families when it's needed most. If you're feeling the effects of stress, call today and let us help you win your personal battles. I want to give a shout out to my family and friends. I want to send a shout out to my husband, to my parents, my family back home. I'd like to give a shout out to my girlfriend, to my family and friends in Lansing, Michigan, to my family out in Tucson, Arizona, to my beautiful wife and children in Des Moines, Iowa, to everybody in Texas, in York, Pennsylvania, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, Harrisonburg, Virginia, Orlando, Florida, Oceanside, California, and Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I love you guys, I miss you, and I hope I'll see you soon. The environment is my passion. 
Every day, I live for the outdoors and all of its challenges. That's why I enlisted in the Coast Guard. Now, I serve to protect the environment and defend my country. It's like I was born for this. Were you born ready for a greater challenge? Find out at GoCoastGuard.com. Service members are allowed to compete in the Warrior Games with which of these injuries? The answer is D, all of the above. Wounded warriors from U.S. Special Operations Command are preparing for inter-service athletic competitions later this year. Marine Staff Sergeant Jason Price introduces us to Team SOCOM members who are taking a chance to compete in sports that are new to them. As part of the Military Adaptive Sports Program, U.S. Special Operations Command's CARE Coalition hosted 45 of its wounded, ill, and injured service members to participate in a week-long training event at McDill Air Force Base, Florida. Well, if you're put in the position to be part of the games, one, I would take full advantage of it. And a lot of us just trying something new and not being so close-minded. Honestly, I've never competed in archery in my life. I shot, uh, shot a little bit as a teenager and haven't picked up a bow since, so I'm just looking forward to getting into the competitive atmosphere. As a C67 quadriplegic, uh, there's not much uh, out there. They said that I could come over here and that they could probably help me make it work, and it, uh, it worked out pretty well. Uh, as far as shooting a bow, I don't have uh, the torso control. Uh, from the shoulders down, I got no uh, domino, no back strain, no nothing. Uh, I also don't have the hands to clasp on or grasp onto anything. So. What we always have to try and do is modify or um, uh, use a lot of duct tape or try and get some gloves and stuff included uh, that can really help out. Both new and old members of SOCOM's Military Adaptive Sports Program are preparing to compete against wounded warriors from the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. I see it as more than just a, a competition to build points and get a trophy. I see an opportunity for some to get together who have not seen each other for several years to many years and uh, in all kinds of uh, camaraderie and team building, which is very, very healthy, not just for them, but for our armed forces in of itself. Marine Staff Sergeant Jason Price, U.S. SOCOM Public Affairs. The USO has made a lasting tradition of entertaining deployed troops around the globe. Even though most troops have withdrawn from the country, the handful of non-combat troops left in Afghanistan did not go without entertainment recently. Army Sergeant First Class David Wheeler brings us this story. Uh, you know, it's, as soon as they asked me uh, if I wanted to, to, to uh, come on the USO tour, I, you know, I definitely said yes and, you know, to show my support for all the troops and because, uh, all I do is play guitar. It's nothing, you know, it's, it's not anywhere close to what y'all do out here and in and, and, and all of the other bases around the world. And, um, you know, so I, I'm here to try to so, show as much support as I possibly can. I, I was kind of hesitant about going. And I, I just had fun just seeing everyone. And you, you get to see a lot of people you know that you work with, and everyone was just having fun and letting loose and, and having a good time. So it, it was, it was, it really was an escape from reality. We're delighted to extend that tradition of USO tours today. We've got world class Broadway musical entertainers, we've got platinum recording artists, we've got famous actors, TV and movie actors. We've got Miss America, I know you already heard that. And, of course, we've got a bunch of really superb athletes. It's going to be a great, great afternoon. It's a good tour, got a good group of people I'm with, and uh, we're having fun just making the troops uh, take their mind off of something for the day, you know? Get them a little excited, put some smiles on some faces, and uh, just have a good time. this lady standing right next to us, huge Colts fan. Just so happened that their coach and a couple of football players were there. Um, 
and she got picked to go on stage, and she was so excited, it made her whole day. And that's one thing we're very thankful when they come, and literally they make our day being here. I just want a big thank you to all the troops here in Afghanistan. It's, it's the, the big sacrifice you guys make that allows us to play football on Sundays and enjoy, enjoy the freedom that, that we have. And we'll definitely be thinking of all of y'all as we start this season. Big thank you again and stay safe. <laughs> Thank them uh, very much for coming and supporting us all. Um, it's it's an incredible feeling just to know that they're taking time out of their busy schedules to come out here, and, and it's a long flight. I mean, we all know what it's like. Um, but just to come and, and give us this little show, this little taste of, of home, per se. Thank you all so much. Divids is a 24-7 operation that provides a timely, accurate, and reliable connection between the media and the military serving worldwide. Through a network of over 200 portable satellite transmitters around the globe and a distribution hub in Atlanta, Georgia, Divids gives you access to the front lines with live and archived broadcast video, still imagery, and print products. Visit our website at DividsHub.net and search through our enormous video and photo library. Register on our website to gain complete access to high-definition content, along with breaking news alerts and webcasts from top military officials. For questions or comments about In the Fight or Divids, you can email us at ondemand at dividshub.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As we close, we feature some of the best photos that Divids has to offer as we listen to Eddie Horst's composition, Pangea. See you next time, in the fight. <laughs>